<laughs> wow, two people on. That was quick. We're starting to get people jumping on, so we'll wait just a little bit, and then we'll kind of get going. Mr. Jarris Nelson, Nick Potter, hello. Tonight. So as you guys saw kind of tonight, we're going to start talking about uh, how to easily find elk feeding and elk bedding areas. Andy Dancero, how are you? Brady, welcome. Bugled me this. Thanks again for help with the chuckle. Not a problem, buddy. So good luck on your trip to uh, to Montana. So should be hitting it uh, just about right and uh, have a pretty good, pretty good trip. Jonathan Alexander, Jay, Anthony, how we doing, guys? So Barry, hello, hello. So yeah, tonight is uh, the eve, opening day tomorrow. And yeah, you guys can kind of see the gears kind of, kind of packed and ready. So, um, you know, Jonathan Alexander jumped on on the Facebook group. Jonathan is a, a student of Elk Calling Academy who actually last weekend harvested his first elk. So called in a, a really nice Rosie, uh, put him on the ground. Uh, really enjoyed, you know, talking to Jonathan on uh, Sunday and hearing the hearing the story. So um, it was. It was pretty dang cool to uh, listen, and you can still hear the excitement in his voice. So, Dustin, welcome. So, oh, sorry. Jonathan is not only a student, but uh, he just reminded me that he is actually a graduate. So, so my my apologies. I don't want to take that diploma away from him. And actually, you know, he uh, graduated and then went out and uh, got it done. So, all right. So yeah, we are here. Tomorrow is opening day. Mr. Casey Gepford. Welcome, buddy. Jarris, Rosie's were hitting the dirt last weekend. So yeah, and he actually got it done last weekend. So um, so yeah, tomorrow is opening day for here in Idaho and also uh, some of the other neighboring states. So it is go time, the time of year that we have waited all year long. Um you know, I ran up last Saturday and pulled trail camera and then sat down Saturday night and went through about 900 pictures. And if I wasn't jacked and excited before going through those pictures was, was phenomenal. So Saturday is Montana, Charles, thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in. So yeah, but Montana, you guys start on Saturday, but you go all the way through mid October with archery. So you guys keep going about two weeks past. So Let's do this. Okay. So like I said, we're going to start tonight on, you know, the easiest way to find feeding and bedding areas. So, um, you know, this works really, really effective if you go into, you know, a new area. And so, um, say for example, I've kind of been scouting some new areas that's just to the north of where we hunted last year. So I have had trail cameras in there, have gone in. Um, but, I'm going to head off kind of midday tomorrow, head up to camp, get camp all set. And then my plan is I am going to head out on a knob that I have to where I can listen to that whole face as it gets dark. And so tomorrow night, I'm going to sit there, let it get dark, and then just start listening for bugles. So, you know, we've, we've talked in the past about, um, you know, night bugling and the advantages of it. It's it's not, I, I mean, yeah, it's a great way to find elk for the next day. But also too, the thing you need to understand is when you hear elk bugling at night, they are in their feeding area. That is the easiest way to find feeding areas in, in new country. So Friday night, gonna sit there. I'm gonna have my phone with the OnX maps. Boom, I hear them bugling. I'm gonna mark that on the map. There's my feeding area. So then tomorrow morning, I'm going to, you know, then the, then the next morning I'm going to get up before daylight and I'm going to start making my way that direction. And as it gets light, I'm going to be close enough to them that then all of a sudden, you know, I'm following, I'm following that herd. 
And as the morning progresses, I'm going to pay attention, you know, where they're traveling, what route they're traveling on and where they're traveling to, because then mid morning, they'll settle down and bang just that quick. I have their feeding area, their bedding area and their travel corridor for the morning from that bedding or from that feeding to bedding. Then I'm going to make my way up on the mountain pretty high and just kind of wait, you know, for evening time for when they get back up and go back to their feeding. And I'm going to see what travel path or corridor they use that then. So, so basically that quick, by the end of the first day, that group right there, you have their feeding area, you have their bedding area, you have their morning travel corridor and you have their evening travel corridor. And you're marking all those on your map. And you do that for every area that you hear bulls bugling when you are, you know, listening to night bugling. So, yeah, you're going to have to fat sacrifice a little bit of sleep. But after a few, you have multiple herds, multiple different bedding areas, multiple different feeding areas. You have their travel corridor. So now the cool thing is, is now when you're back up there listening for bugles at night, you hear a bugle, okay, I know that feeding area. I know where they're going to bed. I know which route they're going to take. And then instead of going to where the bugle is, you go to that travel corridor. Keep your keep the wind in your favor. Then basically you are uh, ahead of the game. So uh, our area in Washington is logged, changing areas yearly. Always give up on uh, logged areas, Stephen. Uh, clear cuts, depending on how much logging they did. So it can actually still produce and, and really grow some pretty good vegetation underneath. Over the hill hunter, do they bugle in feeding areas outside of the rut? So, um, yeah, they'll do they'll do location bugles. So um, even if there's not a cow in estrus. Um, I mean, obviously, you'll you'll know when there's a cow in estrus because there will be a ton of bugling activity. Uh, but it maybe you're sitting there listening and you need to crack off a location bugle to get one to answer back. And that's that's all you're trying to do is get one bugle. And if you've studied that area well enough on the map, and you know you've you've been there with boots on the ground and you know when you're standing facing a certain way you know what's over this way and what's over that way so that way when it's dark you know immediately oh okay they're blah 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 or they're blah 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 so if they're not disturbed will they stick to those travel corridors bugle me this yes and, and that's the reason why i find multiple different places that I can hunt. So I don't have to go back into the same place day after day. I want to keep those elk in their normal patterns as much as possible. So, um, so, you know, like I said, do that night bugling, kind of listen, okay, we've got one pegged, you know, kind of go into an area and then you start your rotation you know, of, of where you go. But then also if you're, if you're, you know, night bugling and you really hear a lot of bugling, especially later in the season, you know, you got a hot cow, that's going to be a hot spot tomorrow. Now, the thing I need to tell you is even though there's all that rutting activity, there's that hot cow, the chance of pulling the herd bull in is pretty dang tough to pull him away from a cow that's in, in, in estrus. But if he's got a lot of other bulls around, it's really easy to call those other bulls in. So um, let's see, we had a couple of other things. So yeah, just like always guys, go ahead and, uh, you know, throw, throw your, uh, throw your questions in. So come on. Can't wait for season. Can't wait for my son to experience his first hunt. Thank you again. Yeah, Scott, you guys are going to have a uh, great time. Jonathan got a rosy with your name on it, brother. My five point out of twin brother. Hey, Jonathan, I told you we'd talk about next year. Mr. Ryan Mayer, how are you doing? I, okay, how about this, guys? Mountain Tough is just tuned in on YouTube channel watching this live Wapiti Wednesday Q&A while he's sitting in the stand elk hunting. That's just not right. Uh, is their bedding area going to be the darkest timber closest to feeding area that you heard them? Um, you know, Andrew, their, their bedding area can actually, you know, vary depending on where you're at. Uh, you know, how much, how far they have to travel from feed to bed. 
it could be close proximity or it could be a mile. I mean, you, you get down Arizona, New Mexico, those areas, heck, those guys could travel three miles or more to, you know, get to water, to get to feed, to get to, um, you know, their bedding area. So each, each area is just a little bit different. That's why, um, <clears throat> You just kind of play it and follow them. Uh, let's see. Can you over bugle? Should you be cautious to keep it to a minimum? Marty, I assume you're asking about night bugling. Absolutely. Just keep it to a minimum. All you're doing is cracking off a location bugle, you know, once every four or five minutes. You're All you're trying to do is just get a bull to crack off once. This is Mason. I'm bored is all I can say. Uh-oh. Mason kind of sounds like uh, not much activity in the stand tonight. So Casey late night or early morning on this, on this night bugling, I normally do this at night. So, um, you know, probably within hour of sun going down hour of it, you know, getting, getting really dark, they should be settled in their bed, their feeding area at that time, be nice and comfortable, uh, be written and more apt to uh, kind of crack off bugling. The early morning locating, that's a little bit different. That's, you know, get up at 3, 3.30 in the morning, get in the truck and start driving a road and bugling up canyons. Then once you get a response. So this one here, um, like I said, it's uh, it's it's night. If, if you already are out hunting, get back to camp, have some dinner, kind of let them get comfortable a little bit. Then you can, you know, go out. And usually by that point, like I said, it's an hour, hour and a half after, after dark and they're good and comfortable in their, in their feeding areas. So what do I do with the next 361 days for you got to cover? Those are all part of punching tags. Yeah. I, I really don't, uh, don't cover that one, Jonathan. You know, if you, if you punch your tag too early, what do you do? I guess you could always um, go get another tag. So if you can swing it, Barry, how you doing? Jarris, do you typically look for north facing slopes as bedding areas? Yes, I do. North and northeastern facing slopes are typically kind of that cooler side of the mountain. And, and, and you'll know you're there as soon as you get on that side of the mountain in that dark timber, you can feel that that temperature drop 10 to 15 degrees. Um, remember too that elk usually bed if you come from the top of the ridge or top of the mountain, you come about a third of the way down. That's typically where they're going to bed. If you have benches in that zone, you can bet your butt. That's probably where you're going to find them bedding. I'm guessing once you find their travel from feeding to bedding, do you try to get above to intercept them on their way to bedding? Um, it's not so much of getting above them. It's, it's getting out front because the tricky thing is, is remember more morning thermals are blowing down. So you want to be close enough to those corridors that it's not going to take much movement or you can actually suck a bull over. But yeah, you're definitely trying to get out in front of them a little bit and really, really be aware of those thermals. But that's the nice thing is, is, is if you've, if you've hunted this place and, and you really understand those corridors and know where they're traveling, you can set yourself up into position to where you can, you know, interact those and, and, you know, kind of, kind of get ahead of them a little bit. So, but just be careful of the thermals success that getting them to the feeding area with the full moon success, getting them to the feeding area with the full moon, uh, Traver, you know, typically with a full moon, they're a little more active at night. And so they are definitely going to head to bed earlier. Um, and that's where kind of knowing their corridors, their travel routes is, is really going to be uh, beneficial because then you can actually, you know, find a good short, quick path in there to where you can get ahead of them. And you, you, you know that if, since, since you can start in the dark and start making your way there, you know, say you're coming in from the left, their, their feeding areas from the right. And then they come into this corridor. If you're coming in from the side, you don't have to worry so much about your thermals blowing to them until you get so close. Um, but you can certainly make some of that trek in the dark. And since they are going to bed so early, you can, you can get in front of them. So, Hey, look at that. We got Garrett Weaver. So if you guys do have not listened to his podcast, go check out on point with Garrett Weaver. He actually just, uh, got the monkey off his back and uh, put a bull on the ground as well. 
Warren, do you work the same bull in an area on consecutive days or would you give it rest? Um, that's one of those things, Warren, where I talked about, um, I, I like to kind of jump to different areas, you know, kind of keep them in their normal pattern. I'm kind of controlling the amount of scent that I'm dropping into their area. Uh, but there have been times that I've gotten in on a bull and I mean, he just, you know, maybe, maybe it was the end of the day, it was the evening and he was really, really hot. Um, we didn't get really close, didn't, didn't, you know, booger him at all. In that case, yeah, I have backed out sometimes and came back in the next morning because of how hot that bull was. So, but most of the time I jumped to different areas. Eddie, good luck to everyone this season. Good luck to you too. Mr. Sean, how you doing, brother? Michael Peacock, Garrett Weaver. Thank you for the shout out, brother. Ah, you bet. You got a great podcast. Thank you. Garrett, use your info. Keep up the good work. So, yeah, I uh, watched a few of your short vid videos. That was that was pretty awesome. Glad you uh, glad you got that. So, what cow call should I use to bring a bull in? Um, you know, actually, Mountain Tough. I actually use my cow calls to set up my bugles. Um, I kind of prefer more to. Uh, you know, bugle bulls in unless I know I am working a young satellite bull. Um, I don't want to get too aggressive with him. So I am definitely going to stay with the cow call. Uh, kind of want to do there is um, kind of just some some mews and chirps, kind of a, a regathering sound and kind of a buzz mew. Kind of something along those lines. Over the hill. <laughs> the one that works. True. The one he responds to and the one he comes into. That's the one you want to use. Two weeks till our Southwest Colorado bow hunt. Super excited. Thanks for all the tips. Not a problem, Robert. Best of luck to you. Um, you know, safe hunt. May your arrow fly true and find its mark and you find success out there. So. Just got in from my hunt, making dinner and heading to bed after this to get out early. Thanks for the info. John, you bet. Good luck to uh, you as well. Mountain Tough, thanks. Not a problem. So, um, okay, for those of you that were on last week, we talked about the hot on the trail scents. So, um, I told you guys that uh, we were going to do a giveaway. For everybody that commented on the Grunt Tube Challenge, I have their name on a sheet. And let's just do this real quick. We have 45 people, so one through 45. Generate. First one is number 20. Jeremy Har Harker. So Jeremy Harker, if you are on this, um, send me an email to Michael at elkcallingacademy.com with your shipping info. And basically what you are going to get is an elk serenity, which is like a bedding area, an elk bull end, an elk an estrus, an earth blend cover scent, Scent Destroyer, which is basically Scent Eliminator. A Wind Checker. And a wristband. And you know what? Mark was so gracious. He sent us a bunch of these. So we're going to give us away another one. Next one, number 35. Number 35, Larry Davis. So, Larry Davis, if you are on this same thing or watching this afterwards, send me an email at michael at elkcallingacademy.com with your shipping address, and we will get that uh, price pack out to you. So, um, also, guys, over on the Hot on the Trail uh, Sense 
Instagram page. Mark has a giveaway going on over there too. So uh, let's see. I've been busted by a bull 100 yards away. What distance do you consider? Come on, why are you not opening? Do you consider, you know, Dwayne, it's really hard to say, you know, depending on the area, you know, it could be 100 yards, could be 200 yards. I mean, obviously, if you're getting pegged from 300 yards away, here's here's the deal, guys. So we, we got to kind of understand how we're how we're dropping our scent. You know, we, we always have dead skin cells on us. And it's those dead skin cells that are kind of dropping off and, and, and floating. So, um, you know, dead down wind has a great, uh, non-scent lotion. Um, I lotion, you know, I use it quite a bit while in hunting camp just to keep those dead skins down. Bryce Scott, if you have multiple bulls bugling, which one do you go after? So, okay, Bryce, I'll answer that in a minute. So, um, But yeah, the lotion to kind of keep the dead skin cells down really, really helps kind of, you know, control that scent a little bit. Um, but, you know, biggest thing is, is, is just remember, you're never going to be 100% scent free. Um, wind, 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 wind. Always keep the wind in your favor. And I prefer more of a crosswind when I'm setting up on bulls because then I don't have to worry if it's going uphill or downhill or this or that. So, um, you know, I learned the hard way early on about, you know, following right behind elk up the hill and trying to catch them and it never failed. You know, you're following them up, trying to catch them and all of a sudden winds in your face. Then all of a sudden you feel that wind on the back of your neck and you just know it's done. So that's why if you have elk going up here, you know, kind of curl and, and try to get up on their plane that way. Cause that way it doesn't matter. Thermals blowing up or down, wind blowing up or down. It's, it's not gonna, not gonna get you. Uh, Dustin, what brand of lotion? Dead down wind. Damn wind. Yes. Uh, soaking everything up. Uh, like a sponge. Thanks for awesome info and insight. You bet. So, okay, Bryce, if you have multiple bulls bugling, which one do you go after? So, um, usually if I have multiple bulls bugling, I'm going to kind of see where they're bugling from. And I'm going to kind of pick a path that, you know, I can work one. And if nothing happens with that, then I can move to the next bull then I can move to the next bull. I, I've seen too many people that'll hear bulls bugle and they'll be like, okay, that one's the big one. That's the one we're going after. Not always the, not always the case. I've seen little tiny bulls that sound like the, the behemoth of the mountain. And I've seen great big bulls that just uh, did, you know, basically a spike whistle. So it's pretty hard. I mean, generally most of the time, yeah, you can get a good indication of the classification of the bull by his bugle. But if I have multiple bulls bugling, like I said, I want to I want to have the opportunity every single one of those, you know, because we are dealing with wild animals. Things can happen. Your setup can be wrong or this or that. They come in before you're ready. I mean, things can happen. So definitely want to set it up that I can just do that domino. If I work this one, and it doesn't work out. I can go to the next, go to the next, go to the next. Trevor Lee, good luck to everyone tomorrow here in Idaho. So. Traver, come on, don't be don't be just showing love to Idaho. We got people from all kinds of states on here. So good good luck to everybody. So uh Jerry, thanks for your time and info. Not a problem. My pleasure. So um so since I am heading to camp tomorrow, I do have Friday's video already uploaded and scheduled to go both on YouTube and on Facebook. It is the grunt tube challenge results video. Um, I think you guys are gonna kind of be surprised. So on uh, which one kind of took the top spot this year. Do you think the heat hot weather has an effect on elk for the rut? It's supposed to get hot again. Yeah, I mean, it can definitely affect, you know, their activity. 
So, you know, the nice thing is we do have pretty cool mornings. So you can get some pretty good morning activity and evening activity, but it does heat up rather quickly. Um, so they're definitely going to be going to bed earlier. But the thing to remember, too, is if they go to bed earlier, you know, there's a good chance that kind of during the middle of the day, they will kind of get up and mill around a little bit, maybe feed a little bit, go get some water. Um, but as far as, you know, flat out bugling, screaming, full on rut activity, um, you know, it's it's going to be kind of limited a little bit. And those those are the times that when it does heat up like that, that they will, uh, you know, be pretty active at night. Tony, hey, Mike, had fun watching. Hey, thanks for tuning in. So good luck to you, too. So, um, okay, so yeah, Friday's video is going to be the uh, results video. So you guys will, like I said, probably be surprised on who came out on the top spot. It's not a tube that gets talked about very much. So, and honestly, I've had the tube for a couple of years. I've blown on it here in the house quite a few times. Um, when I recorded the video was the first time that I blew on that tube out in the mountains. I'm definitely going to be using it. It's one of the tubes that I'm definitely going to put in the rotation this year for using. Um, and, you know, I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, I went out and just turned the camera on outside with the different reads and, and listened to them. And what I've done with all the tubes is I kind of match the tubes to different reads that I have, depending on what combination I'm going to use, you know, for that day. So especially with us being non-brand specific, I want to show, you know, love to, you know, quite a few and all the companies out there that I can. And so definitely got some pretty interesting combinations, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a great year guys. So um, tomorrow night when I get to camp, uh, I will have, um, Lonnie, one of my hunting partners there in camp. So I will record the video for that, um, outdoor vitals, zero degree mummy pod system. So next week, that will be the video for next week. I will be back in town next week for a couple of days. So we will do Wapiti Wednesday Q and A again, uh, next week. So. What, uh, what, what questions guys keep, keep them coming, keep them rolling. So also while I am up hunting, I am going to try to post some semi live updates of how the hunt goes. It just depends. We don't have a ton of cell coverage up there. Uh, but you know, if we do get into spots that we can get a little bit of coverage, we'll be posting, um, semi live updates. And my plan is also to, kind of edit some of those videos quickly and kind of get some of these uh, in the field videos up for you guys and use those kind of as uh, some training videos for you. Two weeks in a day until season here in Arizona it gives me two weeks to go back and rewatch all the videos. There you go, Brandon, I like that. Can't wait since I need to buy a new tube Friday before we go Saturday here in Wyoming. So, um. Yeah, and Jesse, you should have an opportunity, I would say two out of the top three, you should be able to uh, get right there with you. So, Jay, do you use Carlton calls in elk hunting? Yes, I do. And in fact, one of the top reads I'm using this year is the uh, native one and a half uh, by native by Carlton. I just really, really like um, the tone. And, and, and in fact, when I went up and pulled cameras on Saturday, I took that native one and a half and partnered it with the tube that finished in the number one spot, just because I wanted to hear that combo out there. And I'm really, really impressed with how those two sound, sound together. Some really, really good, natural, natural sounds out there. So no, uh, hey Mike, mind sharing what units you're going to hunt? Oregon Rosies should do a live session. Um, you know, no, I don't know exactly where in in Oregon. Um, you know, Jonathan, Jonathan, and I just started talking about it. So once season kind of kind of winds down, we'll really you know talk talk with him more about exactly where we're going to be. But yeah, pretty much if I'm over there um, and and can get coverage, yeah, we'll definitely. Um, you know, do some uh, live stuff out there. 
headed out Friday here in New Mexico. Thanks for sharing your elk knowledge. Keaton, you bet. Best of luck to you. Mr. Josh, Jay, how we doing? Jordan, is there a diaphragm read you would recommend for youth with smaller mouths? Um, yeah, you might take a look at the Mini Master Single. Um, Jordan, Mini Master Single from um, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is a, is a good narrow framed. Um, you know, maybe possibly, you know, some of the amp frames. So um, amp frames seem to, you know, fit a good majority of people. Um, I know Phelps was making conventional reads on a youth frame on a narrow frame. Uh, I think because of the amps, he's, he's, I don't know if he's phasing that out and focusing solely on amps, but, uh, but the, the mini master, mini master single, definitely that's what that call was designed for was youth and, and people with small palates. Thiago, big fan of your channel, man. Hey, appreciate you. Appreciate you tuning in. You know, thank you for all the support. What's your thoughts on the triangle theorem? Um, you know, we've done it a little bit in the past. Like if you've got a bull that just really isn't that fired up, um, you know, we've, we've done the, the triangle before and to kind of, kind of get him fired up. For those of you guys that don't know what Robert's talking about, what the triangle is, is, is you and your hunting partner and, and you have a bull out in front that, you know, he's just not really fired up. Maybe he's given kind of some lazy betting bugles, just kind of, ooh, you know, some little whines. And so what the two of you can do is kind of start calling back and forth. Um, you know, you, you already have designated who's the caller, who's the shooter. And the caller basically kind of starts doing what we normally do, starts doing the breeding sequence. And then the shooter just acts like another bull that's coming into that breeding sequence and wanting to be a part of it. And then we start interacting back and forth. And I'm basically responding to the calling that he's doing. So the bull sounds that he's given to me, I'm responding to those just like I would a normal bull. And a lot of times that bull that's not too fired up, all of a sudden he kind of starts getting more interested because he's like, hey, you know, I, I recognize the sounds that's going on down there. That's that's a bull with a hot cow. And now here's another bull that came in. And now this first bull is being really, really defensive. And it just solidifies everything that you're selling and adds a lot of realism to it. And that other bull is going to start getting fired up. And we actually ignore him for a little bit until he really, really gets going. And then, you know, my partner would go quiet and kind of then slip up in between. And then I start interacting with that bull. And it's a great way to kind of, kind of turn up his aggression and turn up his excitement a little bit. So you can take a bull that's not excited and get him too excited. Andy, have a great night and even better hunt headed to the pillow. Andy, hey, safe travels. Good luck to you, buddy. Mr. Jack, Mr. Todd. Outdoor hunting and day. What is the best ripe to use to the up and out to the tree to keep their until morning? What? What is the best ripe to use? To the Oh, what is the best rope to use to tie up an elk to a tree to keep them tell and there until morning? Gary, I haven't figured that one out. I haven't been able to get close enough to uh, tie one up to a tree. So <laughs> took me a minute to figure out what you were asking. So Todd, uh, is this the last Q&A for a while with the season coming up? No, actually, Todd, I will be on next week. I will be on the week after. Um, so 5th and 12th. Third week, um, probably won't be here for Q&A. I might have something pre-recorded to throw up, maybe a training lesson out in the field about something. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping I only miss that one live Q&A. But yeah, we'll just, we'll keep on rolling as long as I'm back in town because I'm going to head up for a few days, come back for a couple, head up for a few, come back for a couple, and then up for a long one. So as long as you guys keep uh, keep tuning in, watching and asking questions, I'll keep uh, I'll keep rolling on these and keep sharing a bunch of useless information with you guys. So, Mountain Tough didn't mean to type Eli. Huh. 
Hunted an area with years of rubs, but no fresh sign last weekend. Should I try again once pre-rut starts? Yes, absolutely. If, if you have an area that has a lot of rubs in them, um, because you got to understand right now, those bulls, I mean, they're just barely getting rid of the velvet. They're just starting to round up cows and then moving into these, these breeding areas that they like to breed in. And, and, and bulls will go back to that same breeding area year after year after year. It's comfortable. They know it. They know they're safe. And so some of the rubs that probably what you're seeing are rubs that are actually in a breeding area. It's not so much you know, a, a summer, summer area for bulls or a transition while they're, you know, getting rid of the velvet and going down to pick up cows. So you may not see anything when you were in there last weekend, but you may go in there, you know, this coming weekend and there could be fresh rubs all over the place because they, they gathered up their cows and now they're, now they're in that rutting area. So any advice for someone who just started using calls and they don't know if they're making, why is this not letting me open up? So Aaron, I assume um, making the core sounds. So um, you can actually, I mean, I mean, if you've watched our beginner's guide to elk calling a little bit, um, we kind of get you going a little bit there. Um, but the the core sounds, I, I I mean that's that's really what I teach in the one on one lessons uh, with people. So um, thanks, you bet. So um, you know Isaac talked about elk nut and his app. So um, you know th the other thing that you can really do a lot of times, guys, is just go to YouTube, pull up videos of elk. And just work on mimicking, you know, set your phone up and record it so that you can hear the the actual elk making the sound. And then, you know, you you replicate that sound and then you listen back to your recording. That's a great, great tool. That's actually how, um, you know, I learned was putting in VHS tapes of Primos videos and, you know, listen to those bulls bugle and listen to the vocalizations and then just worked on on mimicking those. So. All right, can't wait until October 31st when I head to Northwest Colorado in search of a bull last year. I don't know why this thing won't let me. There we go. Uh, last year was my very first time going elk hunting. Shot my bull on the second day. Second day of season. Uh -huh. We'll never forget. That's awesome. So... Congrats, and hopefully you get uh, get to duplicate that success there, John. Keith, a water bowl while it's hot. Just give cow call every so often with a locator bugle. Um, no, with the water hole there, I mean... I mean Really, it just depends on on you know what you want to call in. If you want to focus on some cow vocalizations and cow vocalizations only, you know, there's a chance that you could pull you know any elk in. If you want to target bulls specific, that's where the breeding sequence is really really effective because that is targeted at just calling bulls. Nat Geo has a great elk call videos. My daughter was using that one for my coaching moments. National Geographic. I don't think I've ever really been over there to uh, check out their elk videos. So uh, Mountain Tough, have you used the unrivaled tube yet? Yes, I have. So um, I've had I've had a couple of them for two weeks now. One I kept the flared end on, the other I actually cut off. I I kind of prefer, you know, that that smaller end. Um, it's just something I'm a little more comfortable with. For me, I think I get more back pressure with it, which, you know, allows me to really hold and control the notes a lot easier and get easier note transitions. So, uh, but yeah, the Unrivaled is a, is a, it, it's, it's an impressive, impressive tube. So hunting an area that usually has cattle on the mountain, will cattle and elk share same areas of the mountain? Yes, they will. In fact, Jerry, that's one thing that's interesting. When I pulled the trail cams, uh, this one area, the, the first several pictures are 
you know, a group of elk that were coming in onto this mid mountain meadow every night. And then all of a sudden the cows showed up. And what I noticed in the pictures is the night that the cows were in that meadow, the elk didn't come. But then the next night when the cows weren't in there, the elk would come in. So definitely cattle and elk will share the same area. And in fact, in a lot of areas, they will both target different feeds. So it's not like they're competing for feed. So cattle will target one source of food where elk sort, you know, target the other. And, and those trail camera pictures that I have, that's, that's a great support for that case. So yeah, it was kind of funny. One night it would be cattle, the next night it would be elk, then it would be cattle, then it would be elk. So uh, you know, probably those those elk were coming down in that meadow when the thermals were still kind of blowing up a little bit. They kind of got to this one point they could smell that the cattle were in there and they just went elsewhere for that night. So um, let's see. What method do you recommend for locating bedding areas and where to find feeding ground? So, Noah, we actually just kind of talked about that at the start of this video on, on how to, how to locate, but you can locate the, the feeding areas by going out at night and listening to them bugle at night. That will, that will tell you their feeding areas. Head toward that, head, head towards that feeding area the next morning, kind of follow them as they, uh, as they head up the mountain to their bedding. Um, just remember, they're going to start going quiet once they get within a couple hundred yards of the bedding. So then you get a real good general idea of their bedding area. And then right there you have their feeding, their bedding and that travel corridor that they're using in the morning to get from one to the other. When do you think the larger herd bulls will start chasing the raghorns away from the cows? Um, you know, Tyler, that kind of varies from area to area. Um, you know, it could be, um, you know, next week, um, Big bulls, I mean, probably usually, you know, by the 10th, 11th of September, um, they're going to be down and, and have chased off the raghorns and and uh, kind of taken, taken ownership of those herds because uh, we're kind of knocking on the door of those cows kind of starting to come into estrus at that point. So they definitely want to be down there and around them about that time. Hagen, Matt Stanton, how you doing? All right. Uh, do, 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 do. Great question. I've been wondering about cattle being in an area. So, yeah, I mean, the area we hunt, there's there's a ton of cattle in it. So, um, I don't know. We've uh, gotten gotten bulls to respond right in the middle of the cattle, and 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 like I said, they they just commingle. I've I've seen more impact with sheep and elk than I have cattle an elk. I've seen where sheep kind of go through an area and the elk just kind of, um, you know, move out of that area for, you know, quite a while. So, but cattle, not so much. How often do you bugle until you locate elk? So, um, Tyler, in, in what context, you know, how often do I bugle? Are you, are you talking about while, you know, in, in the morning, I'm kind of covering ground, trying to locate elk that way. Um, you know, kind of when I get to a locate area, I'm going to do four or five different bugles, you know, from that area trying to locate, um, you know, a couple of, couple of cow sounds as well. If, if I haven't heard anything within that time, then I'm going to move on to my next locate spot. Um, you know, how far between locate spots, it really depends on topography of the, of the, of the mountainside, you know, if there's a ridge or if I'm working, working a trail and I go around a point, obviously, as soon as I go around that point, I'm going to want to bugle again. If I'm going from heavy timber and it kind of starts to open up a little bit, I'm going to want to call there too, because my sound's going to, you know, carry and, and cover more country at that point. So I, I assume that's, that's kind of what you're, what you're asking about there. So, um, do you ever hunt elk deer at the same time in the same area? Traver, yes, I have. And in fact, a lot of times, you know, when, when I'm out archery hunting for elk, I always have a deer tag in my pocket and, and I'm more of a, an opportunity type hunting for the deer. So, you know, if I'm chasing elk and I come across a deer or something, I'm going to take that opportunity because usually in our house, September archery is my time. And then October, 
for that rifle time, I want to focus on my wife and, and, and my daughter. So, um, so I'll go ahead. If I have an opportunity at a deer while I'm out, I'll cut and I'll definitely, uh, you know, take that opportunity. So, but this year, not so much, uh, wife and I drew, uh, rifle tags together. And when you know it, I go up scouting and have seen some, uh, monstrous buck tracks. And so I know I'm going to see some, uh, absolute pigs this year since I can't do anything about it. Sheep stink up in areas so bad it takes a month to get their smell to go away. Yes. Do you change your technique from one part of the road to the next in regards to more aggressive? You know, Tyler, not really. Um, you know, my approach throughout the season is, um, you know, in the morning, I'm I, I'm locating. I'm, I'm getting to my location spots. I'm locating and I'm trying to strike a bull. But I also have certain spots that I'm getting to that I know is their travel corridors or near their bedding area. So if I'm locating, if I haven't located anything by the time I get to that area I want, I set up and I start doing blind calling scenarios. So and it doesn't matter if it's the first day of the season or the last day of the season. So because you're definitely going to get quiet days out there where you don't get nonstop bugling action. Now, as far as the aggressiveness, that really depends on the bull that I'm working. So I let them tell me how aggressive I'm going to get. So, you know, I pay attention to the sounds that they're kind of, kind of doing back. And then I go ahead and, uh, match that aggression or basically kind of control that aggression. Just, just remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about it offense, versus defense. So we always want to be on offense when we are in our calling sequence. We want to control the attitude. We want to control kind of where we're taking that bull. So um, as soon as he starts having the upper hand and he's on defense, it gets really, really tough to call him in because he's the one that's kind of calling the shots at that point. So uh, can you do the breeding sequence real quick or a breeding sequence? Um, you know, kind of, kind of the vocalizations that I did with the cow calls there. Um, that's, that's kind of, I mean, really a breeding sequence. It's just, you know, a few cow sounds and then, you know, adding in some, some raking and then, um, you know, some bugling. So, uh, let's see. What's the best way to hunt reprod areas? Ooh, reprod areas. Man, those can get so thick and tough. Um, you know, if you can really hunt the perimeter of it, unless, I, I mean, sometimes in those reprod, you can kind of get some little open pockets in it. Um, but definitely, you know, try to set up in those reprod to where you're not going to get real long shots because it is so thick in there. Um, and, and really, as you're moving around in them, you're going to be making a ton of noise. So as you're moving to kind of one of those isolated open pockets, you might maybe just do, you know, a couple of soft cow calls. So it sounds like some cows kind of moving through Robert Miller. Got to go. Good luck. all. shoot straight. Thanks, Mike. Robert, you bet. Thanks for tuning in. Good luck. When blind calling, how long do you remain still? Tony, on my blind calling, I usually break it up to where I'll do the sounds. I'll wait four or five minutes. I'll do the sounds again, wrap it up, and I will stay in one area for about 45 minutes before I move on to the next. So I used to do it shorter. I used to get up and move quicker, um, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. But it seemed like those shorter times, as soon as you get up and start moving, you had a bull coming in quiet and he's just standing there watching you stand up and start moving. So 45 is, is, is kind of the rule of thumb that I, I kind of go. Now there have been times that we've set up and we've been doing the blind calling and all of a sudden we got a bull crack off at that point, blind calling sequence is done, get up, start moving, try to get close and engage that bull and work them. So do you carry binoculars to locate elk? Um, I do. So I don't use them a ton because usually I hunt thicker timber, um, but I do have binoculars with me because sometimes, uh, you know, you may break during a midday in an elevated area and, you know, sit up there and glass other parts of the mountain that maybe you haven't hunted in or, you know, other areas and you may catch elk movement moving or you may see something through the binoculars that you can't see through the naked eye. 
Um, but also sometimes when, uh, you know, tracking a bull, um, you know, using those binoculars to kind of look ahead of you uh, can sometimes kind of help you recover as well. So um, how long would you spend on trying to find elk on the mountain before changing locations? You know, Jerry, if I've gone into an area and I've hiked, you know, 15 miles or so that day and I'm not finding any fresh sign, I'm probably going to relocate. So now I'm not going to completely write that area off because it could be something that they move in later in the year. But then again, even though I'm not seeing fresh sign, but if I'm looking around and I'm seeing old sign, you know, old rubs or old wallows or this or that, it could be that the spot that you're in is either one, it's a spot that they move into later in the season or two, it's kind of a spot that they move into once the pressure really gets, you know, hunting pressure gets really too high on the other areas they're at. And this is kind of their safe quarry that they just kind of uh, uh, drop into. I have often, often heard that what triggers cows to go into the heat is amount of light in their eye. Yes, it's, it's the autumn equinox, which is that equal amount of... Um, daylight and darkness. So, and usually, you know, those, those, the autumn equinox, you know, which is the first day of fall hits about the 21st or 22nd. I think this year it hits on the 22nd. So Tony, have you had any problems with dragging wolves in while calling? Um, no, we've, we've had them, you know, light up around us. In fact, last year we were, you know, heading up and, um, got kind of high up on the ridge and we had a, a group of wolves across the drainage from us just kind of start howling. And so we just took a left and dropped right on down and, and kind of got lower elevation down off a face of another ridge kind of away from it. And we actually got, ended up getting into a lot of bulls. So, but yeah, there, there have been a couple of times that, you know, we've, we've had, you know, a wolf kind of come in on us. Um, you know, they saw us about the same time we saw them and they were gone about, you know, that quick. So Noah, what do you consider fresh sign? Uh, you know, fresh sign to me is, is fresh tracks, um, fresh pea spots that, you know, you can still see the ground is, is, is wet. You can still smell them in there and also the poop. So if that poop is green, that is fresh, fresh poop. They were there not that long ago because as that poop kind of sits there, it changes from green to brown and eventually, you know, black. So um, if it is starting to look a little bit brown, you know, just kind of squish it with your boot. Um, how squishy is it? Is it still really green on the inside? Those are all examples of fresh sign. So Bugle me there. So wise man recently told me that where there are wolves, there are elk. That's a smart man right there. So <laughs> we, we did a lesson earlier and he's, he's heading out to Montana. We were kind of talking about the wolves. So that's the thing to remember, guys. If you hear wolves, if wolves are in the area, elk are there. Um, you know, elk are, are the number one feed source of wolves. So wolves are not going to be in an area where there aren't any elk. So um you know, we kind of talked about that a little bit. When wolves were first reintroduced, elk didn't know what they were. They, had, they, they hadn't had to deal with that predator. So, but now we've had enough generations of elk that have grown up with wolves around that, you know, they've, they've learned. They've, they've learned what to do when they hear, you know, wolves howling. And it's, it's not so much that they just leave that area it's, you know, they go quiet, they move into the thicker timber, they know areas where they can go into that they're protected now, that, you know, wolves are going to have a harder time hunting them or getting to them. So, or it could be that they just slip out, slip out of that drainage and right up over the top and down into the next one. So, um, but yeah, they've, they've, they've learned to kind of, kind of co-mingle, coexist a little bit. So, all right, guys, we'll give a little bit longer for one more round of questions. Hopefully, uh, those those couple of guys that we drew their names for the hot giveaway. So um, if you guys are interested in picking up some of the hot, so it's hot on the trail sense. 
So I know Mark does have um, quite a bit of the elk poured right now. Uh, remember, it is just a solid. Oh, such a great smell. Um, go go check them out. So I I, I really really um, have had great success using their stuff. Jason, who did win? Uh, let's see. It was Jeremy Harker and Larry Davis. So were the two two names that we drew. I know originally last week we said we were going to give one set. But Mark was gracious enough to uh, send quite a few over. And and I, actually, I think he has a has a deal going on right now that if you go to a site and you order elk scent, I think you get um, a uh, a wind checker for free with the, with the, any of the elk scents. So, all right, guys, we are almost an hour in tomorrow is the day I had to camp. So I think I am going to cut this one off and I'm going to go spend a little bit of time with my family. They have immediate shipping, got mine in like three days. So, okay. Chris said that uh, Mark's shipping out really fast. He got his within a three day, three day period from ordering. So I know Mark's pretty much on top of things. So, but anyways, I'm going to, I'm going to jump off and go spend time with the family before heading to camp tomorrow. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Thanks for, you know, jumping in. For any of you guys that are heading out, best of luck, safe travels. Um, I don't know if you guys kind of have seen or followed along with Corey with Elk 101 on their Oregon hunt, but Dave Brinker had an accident the other day where he was kind of going through some brush. The brush pulled an arrow out of his quiver and he ended up tripping over that brush. The broadhead ended up going into his calf and Corey and Donnie had to take turns packing him out to get stitches. So be careful guys. Um, but best of luck, shoot straight, may your arrow find its mark, but the biggest thing guys, enjoy the journey out there. As always, thanks for tuning in guys. We will see you next week on another live Wapiti Wednesday Q and A. Have a great night, everybody.